2 Peter chapter 1. Now this is a, I'm going to share a message here today. I'm, I'm titling it Communion and the Tithing Connection. Communion and Tithing Connections to Remember. In other words, it's about communion, it's about tithing. There are some connections between them that I would like for us to understand. And the, and the connections between them that we do understand, we are to remember. Which means what? We are to, they are to be in the forefront of our thinking. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, and, and, and just to pick on that word, remember, it is amazing. But everybody knows that when it comes to Christianity, it's about love. Isn't that right? And um, yet you would kind of think that, and, and, and you know, it, we, 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 we read it all over in all the epistles. It, it constantly tells us how we are to be forbearing, how we are to love one another. In the Old Testament, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and, and fear him and walk in his ways and, and love God and, and love and the perfect love. And so much about the love of God and about walking in love. And you would think that we don't need to be reminded. But yet, it is mentioned so often because we need to be reminded. In other words, God wanted to be in the forefront of our thinking. Why is that? Second Peter chapter 1, I'm just focusing on this word remember for a moment. Um, it says in verse 12, Wherefore, and this is Peter, Second Peter. Peter's getting kind of old now. Right? Peter, Peter's days are numbered. Right? And, uh, and uh, you know, as Peter, you know, Peter, Peter said, as long as, uh, as I'm in this tabernacle. In other words, he knew his time was running out. And he says in verse 12, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. In other words, you know them, but I'm not going to be guilty of not reminding you of them. And that you be established in the present truth. In other words, the very things that you keep recalling and you keep in the forefront of your thinking, those very things you will become established in. No wonder God will keep reminding us in all the pieces about loving God and throughout the word of God because he wants us to be established in it. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am, as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So being in remembrance, having, some, having certain thoughts in the forefront of your thinking will stir you up. Are you with me? It will cause you to be established in those truths, but it will also stir you up. And it goes on to say, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, which is my body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ had shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my de decease to have these things always in remembrance. So Peter's saying that even after I'm dead and gone, I want these things to always be in the forefront of your thinking. Say forefront of your thinking. Because that's what we mean by remembrance. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that point because as I'm going to be talking today about these connections between communion and tithing, and these are things that we are to have in the forefront of our thinking. Amen. The very essence concerning communion, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. But let's back up to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse, verse 9 for a moment. And prior to that, it was talking about, let's back it up further in verse 5. And besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. That's love. And, and if these things be in you and they abound, they will make you that you will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if these things are abounding in you, revelation knowledge will flow. But he that lack these things, that are not operating in these things, is blind. They, they, he, he doesn't see clearly. He, he, Re Revelation all doesn't abound in his life. And he cannot see afar off. Now look at the reason why. Because he had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's an interesting twist. In other words, it was not in the forefront of his thinking that I have been purged from my sins. I've been washed. I've been in cleansed. God is not holding that against me. And because of that, he was not established in righteousness. The Bible says, awake to righteousness. Awake to this reality. And somehow, as we become 
established in the truth and not forgetting that we have been purged for our sins, it opens up the door so that we can operate in revelation knowledge and operate in all of it and be kind and gentle and so on. In other words, then, when you are underneath the yoke of condemnation and guilt, that doesn't cause you to be kind and gentle and sweet and nice. Amen. You want to lash out. You follow me? That doesn't cause you to abound in, in, in the things of God. So, but again, here's the point. The importance of having certain things in the forefront of your thinking. Amen? All right. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Matter of fact, no, I, I'm just going to quote that. And let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, where, where Paul, Paul has spoken about the fact that concerning communion, he says, what I've got and what I understand about communion, I didn't get it from talking to the other apostles. I didn't get it from man. I didn't get it from talking to anybody else. And it, did, and it was not a figment of my imagination, but rather it came to me because the Lord himself revealed this to me. That on the, that on the, on the last day, this is what he did. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. So, so in 1 Corinthians 11, 22, referring to communion, it says, do this in remembrance of me. Matter of fact, let me do, let me flick at that, let me look at that briefly because there's a word in it amplified that I think is important. It's the, the, the King James says, sorry, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, sorry. This cup is a, oh, no, sorry, 24. This, this eat, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. The Amplified says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to your remembrance. Do this so that you can call, in other words, so that you can call affectionately to the forefront of your thinking what I have accomplished for you on the cross. You follow me? So concerning communion, it says we are to have it in remembrance. We are to have what embodies communion and what, what, it, what it entails and the understanding and the revelations and the truth concerning it. We must have it in the forefront of our thinking. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now this is not by any means an extensive teaching on communion nor tithing. But what it is, I just want to point out a few things to point out some similarities and the connections between them. Because quite often, we tend to separate them, and I don't believe we should. Amen? I don't believe in the mind of God it's separated. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Let's read from verse 1. All the commandments which I commend, which I commend thee this day shall ye observe to do, that you might live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers so that you might live multiply and possess what is rightfully yours possess what God has already given to you by promise and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God had brought thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and, and he fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord God. In other words, God says the experience you've had in the wilderness, the experiences you've had in life, is to bring you to the point that you, can, that you must, must bring you to the point where you can recognize that you need the word of God for your sustenance, that the word is your life, the word is your vehicle to victory, the word is your answer in every situation so that you could become humbled, yielded, and submitted to God through his word. He says, your raiment wax not old, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God chastens thee. Therefore, now that's going to be an interesting word. Let me just throw it in here in case we don't quite come to it. But it says, as the Lord... As a man chastens his son, this means corrects and instructs him. It doesn't mean 
It doesn't mean beat him up. You know, like, like some people think that God chastens with sickness. No. Chasing has to do with the, whom the Lord loves. He corrects. He doesn't correct them by giving them a dose of cancer. Amen? And, and we will, when, we read, when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 concerning communion, and it says to judge yourself, which means basically examine yourself, make sure you're in the right place, lest you be judged, lest God has to come and correct you. Because when you are judged, you're going to be chastened, which means what corrected. Amen? Verse, verse, verse 6. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Observe the word, to fear him. Because one of the things that is common in both tithing and communion is the fear of the Lord. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks and waters, of fountains and, and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills. And there is a connection in, commun in, 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 in tithing wherein you are also celebrating and declaring where God has brought you from and the good land that he's brought you into, where you are now in Christ, the promises that are yours. You used to be under the bondage of the enemy. Now you're in Christ with all these great and precious promises. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarcity, and thou shalt, lack, thou shalt not lack anything. You shall not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Where the Lord has brought you into a new covenant. He's brought you into a place whereby through these great and precious promises we can partake of his divine nature. Which is what? Sufficiency. And then it says in verse 11, Beware, verse 10, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord. Quick comment. Tithing, giving is a way of blessing the Lord. Many times, you know, can you imagine? I mean, you say, my children are a blessing to me. How do they, how are your children a blessing to you? The Bible is saying, I bless you, mommy. I bless you, daddy. I bless you. No. They are a blessing to you because of, because of the joy they bring to your heart. Because of the things they do. Because of the kind words they speak. Because of their obedience. Because of their respect. And all of these other things. Amen? So, when, when, so how do we bless the Lord? Not just by saying, I bless you, Lord, I bless you, Lord. Giving and tithing is a means of blessing the Lord. Amen? So it says, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and have built goodly houses and dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast, hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. One of the dangers of prosperity is that people can become dependent and have confidence in their riches and in their prosperity and forget God that gave it to them. I mean, you ask any pastor, and they'll tell you, any pastor that's been passing for a while will tell you how he has seen over his life experiences, people that were believing God, and then finally the victory came, and then they wandered, and then that very victory caused them to wander off from the Lord. I've seen people with financial needs, and you believe God, and then in a breakthrough comes, and then next thing you know, they walk away from the Lord. It, it began to cause them to be, it literally caused their destruction, which is not the will of God. That's why the Bible says um, money will destroy a fool. And the, and the fool, who is the fool? The fool is the person that says no to God. That is not submitting and yielding to him. Then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the, the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth, water out of the rock of flint, who led thee in the wilderness, who fed thee in, in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end, so that God might bring you into a place where, you will, where, where he'll be able to trust you with greater increase, and it not destroy you. And thou say in thine heart, my power... And my might had gotten me this wealth. 
But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, that it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be that if thou do, that if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. All right, so here it is talking about the fact that even after they've succeeded, after they've prospered, they're beginning to take the credit for themselves in that my hands have gotten me this wealth. My ability has gotten me this prosperity. And they forget God. Not remembering that it is God that gives them power to get wealth. It is God that strengthens their, ha their hands. It is God that gives them the ability. It is God that gives them the creative ideas. It is the God that gives them the clarity of thought. Amen. Now, the thing about tithing is tithing is a way of acknowledging and remembering the Lord. All right. So, and I've said all of that just to point out this issue of remembering, which is another way of saying not forgetting. <laughs> is that all right? Psalms 50 verse 22 and 23 says um, in verse, let me turn to it, Psalms, since we're still laying a foundation, Psalms 50 and verse 22. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoso offered praise glorified me. And he that orders his conversation, he that orders his conversation, orders his ways, orders his speech, orders his actions in a, in a manner to honor the Lord, will I show and demonstrate the salvation of God. But it started out by saying, consider this, ye that forget God. In other words, we must not forget God. I know there's a particular minister that says this, um, and, and it's not very, very, he says that if you forget to give God thanks, God will forget to give it to you. Now, I know that's a play on words, but there is, but, but there is, there is something in that that, that we need to, to learn. In other words, we must continually be thankful and continually rejoicing. There's a scripture that I don't like, right? I have to tell you, I don't like it because it's, it's the truth, but I don't like, uh, uh, you know, um, you know the scripture in um, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, where it says, um, where it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Do you know that scripture? All right. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it goes on to say, because I was rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. But, and, and you know, it, it, it sounds harsh. But when you meditate on it, and you recognize other scriptures that says, um, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And when a man operates in the fear of the Lord, he leaves a heritage for his children. In other words, when you operate in the fear of the Lord and in the word of God and reverencing God and honoring God and so on, what happened is that you, you, is like you literally build up a, a, a reservoir of blessing and favor that just falls on your children. In other words, there are promises that might not be, be fulfilled in your life, but because of your faith, because of the way you walk, God is literally to some point obligated to fulfill them in your children's life. Amen? Because of what you do, because of your believing, it affects your children. Because of your lack of believing or what you don't do, it also lack, affects your children. You follow me? So in that sense, it means that if you forget my law, if you forget my word, if you don't walk in my ways, in other words, not only will you not be blessed, but you're also denying the blessing for your children. But the way it is put here is, is um, if you have forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Amen? Now, looking back at this, now I can understand it in the context of the fact that it's written in the Old Testament where there was limited revelation. Amen? And there was inspiration, but not necessarily revelation. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So a lot of things in the Old Testament is written in a strange kind of way. But nevertheless, there is truth there that we need to understand. You follow me? What am I emphasizing? One point. Remember. <laughs> Say remember. Keep certain things in the forefront of your thinking and do not forget. All right. Now, let's talk about oh, some of these connections between tithing and communion that we should be keeping in the forefront of our thinking and not forget. Is that all right? All right. Number one. The tide is holy. Let me give you a few verses of scripture. 
Leviticus chapter 27. Now again, I am not teaching um, uh, 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 to any great extent on tithing. I'm simply pointing out a few things that I believe the Lord would have you to know and be reminded of that you so that you might be established in these truths. Amen? Praise God. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 says, And all the tide of the land, which of this, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. And it is, a, it is holy unto the Lord. It says here that the tide is holy. Now, it's easy to communicate to someone that communion is holy. Because, first of all, we, 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 we call it holy communion. So it's already in our thinking that communion is holy. And when you think about communion and the blood re- and, and, the, um, and, and the, the, the wine representing the, the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's easy to conceive, to have that concept that this is holy. That this bread represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for us. It's easy for us to understand that that is holy. But when it comes to something like money, wherein we've been, we've heard things that, how, um, you know, um, about the love of money, the root of all evil, and someone might think about money as, uh, as, as unrighteous manner and all this other stuff, you know, to think of the tide as being holy is sometimes foreign, foreign to our thinking, but not according to the word of God. What you have separated unto the Lord is holy unto him. And this says that the tide is holy. Verse 32 goes on to say, And concerning the tide of the herd or of the flock, or even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tent, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. So the tide is holy. Communion is holy. Now, because the tide is holy, then it, ne- it means that we need, to, we need to operate in it with the fear of the Lord. Because communion is holy, we need to operate in communion with the fear of the Lord. We need to operate in it with a sense of reverence, with a sense of honoring God, with with, with some understanding and some knowledge. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14. In fact, concerning, as you're turning there, um, concerning communion, it says in in, 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 um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul had told, told the, the believers that when you come together for communion, let every man eat at home. Right? Because what was happening is these folks were, were, were approaching communion like it was a, it was a place to, uh, you know, to get fed. It was a, I mean, they, they come to communion because they're hungry. They come to communion and they, I mean, they eat everything before anybody else gets a chance. I'm serious. This is what was happening. All right? And, and, um, and so Paul Adam says, hey, tarry one for another. Wait for one another. <laughs> In other words, they were, the way they were handling it was not with the respect and the honor and the fear of the Lord that ought to go with handling something that is holy. And so it is with the tithe. In other words, you wouldn't just take communion and just, you know, you know here. Go. No, you, there's a reverence involved. Well, so it is with the tithe. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, it says... Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the first things of thine herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. In other words, according to that scripture, just as you go through the process of tithing, the tithe is the tent. Tithing is the process. You know, this might be the gift. The way in which I give it to you is the giving. If I say, here, I have a nice gift for you. Take it. That's not cool. You follow me? Right? But if I, if I, if I, if I give wrap it and I present it to you nicely, there, there's some respect. There's some honor in that. Well, so it is with the tide. It is, the tide is the tent, but how you handle it is tithing. Hence, in another place, it talks about tithing the tide. And in the process of tithing the tide, the fear of the Lord is relevant. Are you with me? Amen? 
So what am I saying? I'm saying that we are to remember and have it in the forefront of our thinking that both the tithe and communion is holy, and therefore we ought to approach it in that manner. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, turn with me to... Mm, and therefore, actually, if we are... Should we go there? Yes, we... Yes. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, can you imagine if I had, if I had um, uh, an egg, right? I had an egg and it's gift wrapped. You don't know it's an egg, and I don't know, you don't know it's an egg that is gift wrapped. I, 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 don't, I don't even know it's an egg that is gift wrapped. I, a, I mean, I might handle it in such a careless manner, I could make a mess. <laughs> you follow me? I could drop it on the ground, I could throw it around. I could handle it in a manner that will destroy it. Why? Because I don't have any discernment and understanding that what's inside that, inside that beautiful gift wrap paper is an egg or a dozen eggs. You know what I mean? Can you imagine you give a, give a kid a, um, a gift at Christmas and it's, this, it's a box of eggs, but it's nicely gift wrapped and he thinks it's a toy? You follow me? What would we have a problem here? Lack of discernment. Lack of understanding. So if you're going to treat it right, and if you're going to operate in the tide and in communion correctly, with fear and with reverence and with honor, you also have to have discernment. It is the lack of discernment that has almost ruined communion in the body of Christ and has made it a religious tradition in most church circles. And as a result of that, the Bible says that when you, when, you take, when you take the things of God and you just make tradition out of it, then you make the word of God of what? None effect, which means what? It is a waste of time. It's just a ritual. Is that true? Is that in the word? Yes. Amen. So, but without discernment, that's what happens inevitably. When you come along and other people are doing it, so you just do it and you don't have understanding. So understanding is also important. First Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to do this very briefly. Reading from verse uh, 22. Paul says, <laughs> Okay, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me and hold this in the forefront of your thinking. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do it with an affectionate recalling to your mind and bringing in the forefront of your thinking what this is all about. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, what are you doing? You are showing, you are demonstrating the Lord's death till he come. That being the case, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Now, unworthily does not mean that, um, that he is a sinner. Unworthily does not mean that, um, that, 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 that he's, he's disqualified. No, unworthily because he is doing so without understanding, not discerning the Lord's body. And we will see that. Whosoever will, shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. Do you see that? Not discerning the Lord's body. So in other words, that let him examine himself. Let him make sure that he is in the right position and that he is discerning the Lord's body and he's recognizing what this is all about. And then it goes on to say in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. 
Many get sick, many die because they don't recognize what this is all about. They don't recognize that this is a body that was broken so that they don't have to be. They don't recognize that this is a body that took their sickness, took their, uh, their sin, took all of that, that they could be set free from these things. That, that hung up on the cross is a curse. And because they don't recognize that, they aren't able to do it in faith. And if they're not doing it in faith, without faith, what do we have? No grace. Isn't that right? It is a faith that it may be by grace. So all they're doing is going through a ritual and not getting the benefit they should. Which ought to be healing, wholeness, deliverance. All right. All right, let me just stop there for now. But the point is, the point I'm trying to make here is that the tide is holy. Communion is holy. We are to receive it and operate in it with the fear of the Lord, with reverence for God. But in order to do that, we must also have some discerning, some discernment and some understanding of both communion and the tide. Amen? All right. Now let's look at let's look a little bit further. So there is a connection between the two, which is between tithing and communion, which is the fact that they are holy. And because they are holy, there's some other implications operating in the fear of the Lord. The Bible says in 2 um, Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. You cannot operate in, the, in holiness without the fear of the Lord. So if you're going to talk holy, then you've got to talk the fear of the Lord. Amen? And if you're going to talk the fear of the Lord, you've got to have understanding. Are you with me? Amen. All right. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, let's pick this up in verse 14. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, what had happened is that these kings got together, attacked Sodom, and his, his, his nephew um, Lot was living in Sodom and Gomorrah with his family, and these kings came, attacked Sodom and Gomorrah, and captured all the people, right? And took everything, including Lot, and was taking them into captivity. And Abraham heard the news. So it says in verse 14, when Abraham heard that his brother, which is Lot, um, his cousin brother here, but his, his nephew, was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. Can you imagine that? Born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Can you imagine you've got 318 servants so that you get into a fight? All you, all you, all you do is you just get your servants, go get your weapon. We, got, we, we have a battle to fight. I mean, that's kind of cool. Right? That's prosperous, wouldn't you say? And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them onto Hoba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Now, that's quite interesting. Where did these guys learn to fight? Where did Abraham get this kind of strategy to just have only 318 servants and to defeat an army and I think five kings? Where did he get that kind of wisdom from? Where did the servants get that kind of training from? Good question. Hold that question. Hopefully we'll, we will come back to it. Actually, let me answer it now. <laughs> let me answer it now, just in case we didn't. When you learn to operate in tithing, tithing also has a covenant connection where it activates the covenant where God, because you see in covenant, if two people make a covenant and one of them is a former, right, and the next one is a warrior and they, 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 they have a covenant with each other, then if the foreman guy is ever in trouble, then whatever ability the next guy has to be a warrior, his resources will come and deliver him. If the warrior guy is, is starving, this former guy will not let him starve. His provisions of food will feed him. In other words, when two people are in covenant, all of your strengths become my strengths, and all of my strengths become yours. There's an exchange. And, and in the two of us becoming one, that's what happens. So what happened is that, so what, so be, and the tide establishes the covenant, and so does the communion as well. And, and in the establishment of the government, it means whatever resources God has becomes yours. So if God has a supernatural ability to, to train these servants to war, to, to strengthen their arms and teach them to fight, then that becomes your, your inheritance. If God has some 
some miraculous strategy by which with just 318 people you could overcome an army of hundreds of thousands, then that, that, that battle plan becomes yours. Amen? Isn't that good? That means whatever, whenever you have a problem, who you think has the answer? All right? So because of that, um, when you operate in that covenant connection, then what happens is that you may have problems, but God has answers. He's got solutions, and his solutions become yours. And you can access it by learning to operate in communion and tithing. I heard about a, a story, you may, you may have heard it too. I don't know if it was the First or Second World War. Whichever World War they were with U-boats. Which World War was that? Second World War? Was it, who had the U-boats? Was it, the Germans had the U-boats. Well, right? Was it the Germans? Had, anyway, but anyway, they, these things were um, causing a lot of problems. And um, was it that or reverse? But either way, and there was a particular... They needed to come up with a weld in order, to, in order to, 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 to produce these ships quickly and build them on land. And when they, you know, when they slide them into the water, they don't crack. And they, they, they could not come up with a weld that was strong enough. And there was this particular man who was a tider. told them that, and they say, he, they said, and he told them that I've got an answer. They said, what is the answer? He said, ask me tomorrow. In other words, he, wasn't, he didn't actually have an answer in his head, but he had a covenant with God, and he figured, I'm going to fast, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to seek the Lord, and I'm going to get an answer from God. And he went, spent time with the Lord, came back, and got a formula that came up with a well that, so that they were able to build the ships very quickly. Amen? And without that, who knows where we would have been? Alaska, <laughs> Russia. <laughs> you follow me? The point of the matter is, um, just by simply being able to operate in covenant with God effectively, then what is his becomes yours. So, and that is part of the secret as to why Abraham was able to get these. In other words, because of the, of, 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 um, the covenant and the tithing connection to the blessing, which had the power to train the servants as well as to provide, to provide the answers that were necessary, they were able to win this victory. All right, let me continue, however. And in verse 16. And he brought back, so he, so he, um, so he, after he heard about it, his brother was, was taken captive, etc., etc., he got 318 18 of his um, servants together, and he pursued them unto Dan, etc., and he divided them, uh, and he, he divided himself against them, smote them, and delivered his, delivered his nephew. Verse 16. And he brought back all the goods also. He brought back all the goods and also brought again his, his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheradoloam Moor and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shevek, which is the king's, which is the king's, which is the king's deal. Now look at verse 18. And Melchizedek, King of Salem, not King of Sodom, King of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him. And he said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of the heaven and the earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thine hand and had given them tithes of all. And, and, he, and he, Abraham, gave them tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the portions and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take, that I will not take from a tread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say that I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me. Let them take their portion. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, here we see a situation where, where Abraham is returning from, the, from defeating these kings. And who comes out to meet him? Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who is a high priest representing God. And Melchizedek comes, and he, what, what does he have with him? Wine and bread. What does that represent? Communion. So he comes with the wine, and he comes with the bread, and he blesses Abraham. And Abraham, in turn, gives him the tithe. 
And he blesses Abraham saying, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of the heaven and the earth. Declaring that through the covenant connection that Abraham had with God, that Abraham was now possessor of the heaven and the earth. Amen? And then, um, and, 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 um, and then, and then, and the king of Sodom told Abraham, hey, you can take the gold. He says, I don't want it. I don't want it. Because I don't want anybody, I don't want you or anyone else to be able to say that you made me rich. I'm going to be made rich, but it's not going to be, it's going to be because God is going to do it. And he says, I have lifted up my hand. In other words, I have sworn and I've made declarations before God concerning my finances. And I'm not going to do that. And as a result of that, in the beginning of chapter 15, verse 1, God showed up and says, Fear not, Abraham. I am your reward. I am El Shaddai. I am your exceeding great reward. I am your overabundant, overflowing supplier and sufficient, sufficient one and so on. All right. Now, what can we see in here? We see a, a couple of things. We see, because we see here Melchizedek coming with, 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 with communion and with a blessing, and we see Abraham coming with a tithe. We see both communion and we see tithe here together. Do we? Amen. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about the blessing. The blessing, is, 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 let's talk about the blessing. First of all, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, what are we talking about? We are talking about some connections between the tide and the blessing that should be in the forefront of our thinking. Now again, we think about communion. Unfortunately, it has become so much of a ritual that a lot of the truths are lost. Here is a very, very important truth concerning communion. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. It says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, which we break is it not the communion of the, of the body of Christ? What is the point? It calls it the cup of blessing. In other words, according to this scripture, communion is connected up to the blessing. Communion is, is connected up to the blessing. Now, let's, 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 let's back up a little bit and think about this. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, how Jesus hung up on the cross, he became a curse for us, for a curse is everyone that, that hung it up on the tree. And he did it so that we might be redeemed from the what? From the curse of the law, and that the what? Blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. That same blessing that Melchizedek was pronouncing on Abraham, that that might come upon the Gentiles. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. All right. So, for us, we are redeemed from the curse. The blessing belongs to us. Say but. But. Here's the but. Not a nice but, but it's a but anyway. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says, The curse causeless shall not come. In other words, the curse can't come if it doesn't have an open door, if it doesn't have access. Now, here is a fact. You and I, when you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, you are redeemed from the curse, the curse of poverty, the curse of spiritual death, the curse of, of um, sickness and disease, the curse of, um, of, of, of bad relationships and all of that. You are redeemed from all of those curses. Amen? Amen? However, because you are redeemed from the curse, doesn't mean the curse don't exist. Because you might be outside, and it's raining, and you have an umbrella, and you have a raincoat, and you have a nice big hat, and you're not getting wet, doesn't mean it's not raining. Is that true? But, uh, but the thing is, you're not getting wet because you've got an umbrella, and you've got a raincoat, and you've got a big hat. <laughs> are you with me? Well, in the same way, the curse exists, but Jesus has provided through the cross an umbrella and a raincoat so that we can live in this world and be protected from the curse. Communion is part of that deliverance from the curse. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we looked at earlier, when someone operates in communion and they don't have discernment, they don't understand that they're dealing with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for them. And they don't discern all of that. What happened? They end up being what? Weak, sick, and some even die. 
In other words, the curse operates in the area of sickness because of not discerning the Lord's body. You follow me? So what am I saying? Communion will, 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 will when you operate in communion and you do it in the fear of the Lord and you do it with faith and you do it with understanding, what happens is that even though the curse exists, you can be protected from it and not fall underneath the condemnation of the world. The world don't have any choice where sickness and disease is concerned. They don't know about communion. They don't know about another way of escape. You follow me? But when we do not take advantage of communion, then what happens? We are just as vulnerable as anyone out there in the world. And the Bible calls it being condemned with the world. Are you with me in that? So the point of the matter is communion is connected to the blessing. And so is tithing connected to the blessing. In fact, just before I leave communion, remember, remember how in the Old Testament, um, in Exodus chapter 12, where when, it's, when, when they put the blood in the doorpost and they ate the Passover lamb, and what happened? The dead angel passed over them and they were all healed. There was not one sick or feeble among them. Isn't that right? That's what? That's redemption from the curse. That's the blessing operating. Amen? Was that the same report for the Egyptians? No, it wasn't. Amen? But now, the same thing is also true where the tide is concerned. Let me back up and, po and point this out. For instance, God, people might think, oh, the tide came with the law. First of all, the tide was before the law. Genesis chapter 14, where we saw about Abraham paying tithe to Melchizedek, the law was not even given. Amen? But the tide, even go, was, the tide was even in place before then. The tide was in the Garden of Eden, when God says, you can have everything. You can eat anything you want, but this here is mine. This is separated unto me. This is holy unto me. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? And what did Adam do? He disobeyed God. And what did he do? He ate of that tree. And because of that, he opened up the door and the curse came upon him and the entire human race and all of creation. Isn't that right? Now, here is the point. On the other hand, God had said... The Bible says when God created Adam, God blessed him. God had said, um, God blessed him, and God said, be fruitful, multiply, um, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. That's the blessing in operation. If Adam had obeyed God and had not eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what would have happened? His obeying God by, by operating in the tide of just obeying God in that matter would have activated the blessing. And it would have activated and, and it would cause him to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and the word which God had spoken would have come alive. Well, in the same way, there are many promises that we have, that such as, such as um, Proverbs Chapter 10, 22, that says the blessing of the Lord make it rich and add no sorrow with it. When we operating in tide, that blessing comes alive. That's the reason why it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, bring all the tithes into my storehouse and prove me now, say the Lord of hosts, if I will not pour out the blessing. Isn't that right? What am I trying to point out? I'm trying to point out that the blessing is connected up to both the communion, the cup of the blessing, and to the tide. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For that reason, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where it says about he that gives sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He that gives bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And God loves a cheerful giver. And then it goes on to say, and God is able to what? Cause all grace to abound towards you. All grace, all sufficiency to abound towards you that you might have all sufficiency in whatever area. All grace, all grace means the grace of finances, the grace of healing, the grace of deliverance, or whatever else it might be. All manner of grace. You ever heard in um, Philippians 4 verse, ni verse 19, my God shall supply what? All of your need. Is it just financial? No, it's in every area. What is it connected up? It's connected up to giving, isn't it? You get my point? Now, you see, the thing is, if you don't know this, then you can't operate in faith concerning it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Lord is saying, these things need to be in the forefront of your thinking so that as you tithe, as you operate in communion, know that the blessing is activated and know that you now have access to all the grace. In other words, all of these promises that are yours, this is a way to activate them. That promise was there for Abraham, but Abraham acted. The promise was there for, for Adam, 
But if he had obeyed God, he would have activated the blessing. Are you with me? Can you see what I'm saying? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I even preach it myself. I think I like this myself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, the tithing is also, and communion is a covenant connection. For instance, Jesus himself said that this cup is the new what? In my blood, it is a new covenant. He said that this here is connected to the covenant. It cannot be any more clear than that. Which means that you can operate because, and if, if it's a covenant connection, if you can call on the covenant, you can put pressure on the covenant. Psalms 25 verse 14 says, um, the secret of the Lord is reserved for them that what? Fear him. And to them, the Lord will demonstrate or reveal his covenant. Which is what he did with Abraham. He revealed his covenant to Abraham as, I am the one who's going to train your warriors, train your servants to war. I'm the one that's going to give you a strategy for victory. I am your defense. I am your rock. I am your fortress. A lot of what we sing of, that's, those are covenant. All the names, all the Jehovah names. What is the name Jehovah? Jehovah means God revealing himself as, as what? Jireh, provider, as Rohi, your healer, as the shepherd, as your righteousness, whatever it might be. And tithing and communion connects you up with the names of God. It connects you up with the covenant. That's why, that's why we should not be surprised when we find out that it will cause all grace to abound towards us. I remember there was a man that wrote a book one time that, said that was called, A Seed Will Meet Any Need. And there's a lot of truth to that. Because in your seed, you are able to release your faith. Amen? For whatever the promise might be. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And, and um, so we started in, in Abraham's case. And again, don't forget... Unto them that fear his name when he reveal his covenant, tithing and communion, as we've talked about before, both of them are demonstrations when you do it right, that I fear God, I respect God, I honor God, I trust God, I'm in covenant with him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and so it positions you for the manifestation of the covenant. Here is a, here is a, here is a truth concerning the issue of seed. The law of seeds, of seed, which is sowing and reaping, when you understand this, when someone plants a seed, a farmer doesn't plant a seed and, 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 um, and goes off in despair. When he plants a seed, based on his, his experience, he is encouraged and he has hope, he has excitement, he has an expectation of a harvest. In other words then, when you operate in seed, seed time and harvest, when you operate in, in tithing, there ought to automatically be a confident expectation and excitement about a harvest that is coming my way. Are you with me? And if there isn't, then you're not operating in faith. And we, ne we need to operate in faith. We need to, the, whether it be communion or whether it be tithing, we need to operate in faith. Concerning that, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 23, Right? To the Pharisees, he says, you tithe, but you forget faith and love, etc. In other words, and he says, this you should have done, but not leave the other undone. In other words, you should have tithe, but do it in faith, do it in love, do it in mercy, etc., etc. Amen? So, a connection between the two is the fact that they're holy, both holy. There is the blessing, there is a covenant connection, and then number four, there is a faith connection. What do we mean by faith? This expectation of victory. This expectation of, 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 of whatever help or resource that you need. Amen? And then if, if there is no faith involved in communion, if there is no faith involved in tithe, then it's a dead ritual. Because the Bible says that it be, it be, when it becomes just a tradition of man, it makes the word of God of none effect. Faith makes it alive. Understanding, revelation, blessed be the name of the Lord. Number five, and I like this here. It says in, in, in concerning the communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 28, Jesus said, and when you do this, do this in remembrance of me, for you do show the Lord's death until he comes. You do show the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28, you do show 
the Lord, no, 26, I'm sorry. You do show the Lord that he comes. The Amplified says, and you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So you are declaring that Jesus died, but you're declaring it till he comes again. You're declaring it, and you're saying he is coming again. Amen? So in communion, there's a declaration. You are declaring, you are declaring that Jesus came. You are declaring your faith. You are declaring that you are expecting his return. You are declaring that that body was broken for me. You are declaring that you've got a new covenant. You are declaring that the blessings of the Lord are yours. Amen? You are making a demand on these things. There are declarations that are involved. Tithing, same thing. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Now, I personally believe that tithing, first of all, I think you should have communion at home and in church, but since you're at home much more than you are at church, you should have more of it at home. <laughs> I also believe that, that, that tithing Right? Should be done, the, the, the tithing process should be done primarily at home. Amen? And it's at home is when you should be making all your declarations and your confessions and so on. Deuteronomy 26, I'm just, this whole chapter is about tithing. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to pick up a few verses. Verse 3. And thou, and thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days and say unto him, I profess unto, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come into the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers. In other words, you are to declare, you are to declare, when you, when you, when you tie, you are declaring, Lord, not only have I come out of Egypt, not only have I come out of a bondage, but I declare that I'm in a good land. I declare that I'm a child of God. I declare that I'm a partake of your divine nature. I declare that all your promises are yes and amen unto me. I, and, and you are able to make declarations concerning your family. Concerning your body, you are able to make declarations. Um, verse, ver, verse, what other verse? Verse 3, verse, verse 10. And now, behold, I brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it before the Lord thy God and worship the Lord with, with, with it. Verse, verse 13. And then you shall say before the Lord. And then, then later on it says, and then you shall say, Lord, look down from heaven and bless the work of my hands. In other words, you can, uh, you can make strong declarations and should be making declarations around your tithe and around communion with joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Now, you see that passage that we read back in in Genesis chapter 14, when it spoke about Melchizedek meeting Abraham and so on, and him coming with wine and bread and, and bringing the blessing and Abraham giving him his tithe, Paul talks about it in Hebrews um, chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in chapter 6, um, in chapter 6, Paul said in verse... In verse, well, I'm, I'm heading to verse 18. Paul said, when, when God said to Abraham that in blessing I will bless thee and I will multiply thee and so on, so that Abraham could have a strong consolation and have his faith anchored, it says in verse 18 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. In other words, my question is, what are these two immutable things that God gave to Abraham that caused his mind, his will, his emotions to become so anchored? Some say it's an oath. Some say it was a promise. Some say it was the cutting of the covenant and the blood of it. I believe it is exactly those same two things that, that Melchizedek come with, the bread and the wine. Symbolic of the body and the blood and the Lord and, and God today is saying to us because of the body of my broken body of my son and his shed blood, you've got strong consolation and reason to hope. Amen? And reason to believe. And so it talks about that and you will read in several places. I don't have time to go through all of them. But if you search it through, you will find in many places it speaks, talk, it will call you will find the phrase, the order of Melchizedek. Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, the order of Melchizedek. Um, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 20. Jesus, the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7. 
Where else is it? The order of Melchizedek, verse 17, verse 21, and a few other places. The order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? I believe it means exactly that. <laughs> Jesus has the same orders that Melchizedek had. What was Melchizedek's order? Minister to them. Minister to Abraham, the wine and the bread. Minister to them, um, the broken body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And minister to them the blessing and receive his tithes. And the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse, verse 6, But he who is descended is not accounted from them, received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he of whom it is witness that he liveth. In the same way that Melchizedek, there was no proof of his death or anything like that. In the same way Melchizedek was a high priest forever, Jesus is a high priest forever. And the same way Melchizedek received the tithes in the same way, Jesus received tithes. And there's a deck, there is hence a witness or a declaration every time we tithe that Jesus is our high priest and he is alive. Amen? What is the point? There is declarations that are involved in both communion. You show the Lord is dead until he comes. And in the tide, you're declaring that I've got a high priest. His name is Jesus. He is my Melchizedek. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And because of that, the Bible says, because of that, what happened? God revealed himself to, to, to Abraham as El Shaddai. And he will reveal himself to us as our provider, as our source. And then as we come into the close, number six. That Jesus is the high priest, the high priest connection. Jesus is high priest over the communion and that he ministers it to us, but he's also high priest over the tide. He is the Lord of the tide. And hence, and he ministers the blessing. And because he is Lord of the tide, he is therefore responsible to cause the, the scriptures that you are standing on and the faith that you are releasing to be fulfilled. He watched over his word to perform it. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says that Jesus is the apostle and high priest. Means he's anointed to carry out this service. Amen? And he's a faithful high priest. And when you say the same thing he does, he watches over your word to bring them to pass because your words are agreeing with his words. Are you with me? That's the reason why that also explains why these things must be done in faith and why words are involved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says he gives us the power to get well. Now, in closing, let me, let me just give you this one other thing, number seven. Revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge. Remember how in the tithe it says, bring all the tithes into my storehouse? And prove me now, say the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you might not have room enough to receive it. What is that? Is that that God just pours gold and stuff down from heaven? Is that what it is? The gold and stuff is in the earth. I believe that part of what God does, he opens up the windows of heaven. Why? So that we can see into the realm of the spirit and we can see things that others cannot see. And we can get the revelation and the understanding how to do things better, how to do things more efficiently, how to be where the answers are. Revelation knowledge comes alive as you tithe. In other words, you can when you tithe, if you I mean you've got a problem that, that is so stubborn, it looks like you you don't seem to be able to get to, to, to solve it. You can't hey, release a tide over it. Or pray over that problem in relationship to your tithe and believe God for the revelation when you pray. Hear me, believe for the revelation when you pray, not believe you receive it when you get it. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> In other words, you don't decide, well, all right, I I'm believing for this revelation. And then when you get it, then you think you have it. No, you pray and you ask God, Lord, I, 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 you know, this situation has to be taken care of. And I don't know the answer, but you know the answer. And I'm asking it for you to show it to me. And I believe I receive it and I thank you for it. And you believe you receive it before you even have a clue what to do. And then you stand in faith and expect and keep your an antennas out there so that you can get the wisdom of God that is needed. Amen? Are you with me? So tithing connects you up to revelation knowledge. Communion also connects you up to revelation knowledge. Why? Because when you operate in communion, you're operating in humility and meekness and the fear of the Lord. And God has promised to teach those that are meek. He has promised to reveal his covenant to those that will fear him. 
And here, is a, and here is proof of that. In Luke chapter 24, remember the guys on the road to Emmaus? Remember that? When Jesus came alongside and was talking with them about the things that had happened in Jerusalem, Jesus was there physically, and they did not recognize him. Now, you want to hear an interesting mystery? If Jesus were to show up physically, you would not recognize him. You know why? The Bible says we cannot know him after the flesh. That's what the Bible says. It might not make sense to me, but that's what the word of God says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and I think verse 16. We do not know him after the flesh. So even though this same Jesus was hanging out with them and walking with them, they could not recognize him. But, bless God, in, um, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 30, it says, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. What does that sound like? All right. And their eyes were opened. Revelation. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> In other words, then there's revelation. There's an open door of revelation and understanding that comes through the tide. Amen? Amen. Now, one final thought. Jonah. Say Jonah. After, and there's a scripture that really impresses me, Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. When Jonah got into trouble, in the, and he was in the belly of the fish, and, um, and he cried out, and he, and he talked to God, and he, and he talked to God about his deliverance out of that fish, and he really prayed about it in faith. He really did. Well, we look at the first part of the chapter. It was really good. But while after he prayed, because he had confidence in God's mercy and God's deliverance, even though he was still in the belly of the whale, but he had believed he received what he desired when he prayed, even though he was still in the belly of the whale, even though there were still seaweeds around his neck, and I don't know if it was a whale, it was a big fish, even though there were still seaweeds around his neck, and even though there was probably the smell of inside that fish intestines and stuff, even though all of that was happening, um, Jonah began to give God thanks for his deliverance. And Jonah made this statement in Jonah 2 verse 8. He says, They that observe lying vanities, um, what's the word? They, they, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. If they observe lying vanities, and by that he was talking about the symptoms. He was saying, in other words, these symptoms here looks, make, looks like there's no deliverance for me and I'm not getting out of here. But he says, if I believe that, I am going to chop off the, my deliverance. And he says, therefore, he says, all of these circumstances, the seaweed, the smell inside here, the darkness, I call it, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I say it's a lying vanity because it's trying to tell me not to expect my deliverance. And I, I say that's a lie. And, and, and so he made a statement that if we observe lying vanities, we will forsake the mercy and the hand of deliverance. Take that a little bit further. It would mean if we will not operate in faith, we will chop off the hand of deliverance. If we will, first, if we will not, and when you operate in faith, when you operate in communion, what are you doing? You are operating in the fear of the Lord. You are operating in faith. You are saying, I believe God. You are honoring God. And, it, and it is, or we can read into that, that when we do not operate, for the person who does not tithe, who does not operate in, um, in, in, in communion with discernment, he forsakes and he is robbing himself of his mercy and his deliverance that is available to him in Christ. I don't know about you, but that's serious. And when I understand that God looks to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to see, to and fro, to show himself strong, to show compassion. God is saying, I'm just, I'm just bubbling over. I just want to bless somebody. I got, I'm just bursting. Who would allow me to bless them? And he's just, but he's searching. Why is he searching? Because it's not that easy to find somebody. He wants to bless. He wants to do good. But in order for him to do that, somebody got to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. And he is not able to find people that can have confidence in his compassion. That is why as great as the mercy is, from the, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy. But it's to them that what? 
fear him. It only flows to the ones that will believe in that mercy, believe in that compassion, believe in that goodness. So he wants to. But if we don't operate in the fear of the Lord, if we don't operate in faith, then what happened? Then what happened is that we forsake the very mercy and compassion and grace and abundance that he has for us. And here in communion and tithing, God has given us something easy on a platter. And he say, here, do it, do this. <laughs> here is a means by which you can continually access my grace, access my mercy. And I believe that that is why I believe it's not something we should just do in church. It's something that it ought to be a lifestyle. Be careful that it don't become a tradition. But then if you keep the word alive, it wouldn't. But it's something that where we are to live in that communion, live in that fellowship, live in that reverence. And, and where we can, because you see, the fact of the matter is, you've got a promise where, I mean, Jesus bore your sicknesses, carried your diseases and all of that. But do you know that the Bible does not promise you that you're not going to have tests and trials? The fact of the matter is you will have tests and you will have trials. And sometimes some of them might be difficult. And sometimes you don't know what to do. Well, tithing and communion is a means by which you can release your faith. It's a point of contact that God says, here, this is easy. Do this. This is the way in which you can release your faith and Put, your, put a line in the sand and say it's done in Jesus' name. 